Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. David Cobb is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button. Like your Brandon Davies, you have consent. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, also do that while you're here. Okay, let's get into it. David Cobb, it's a perfect day to have you on the pod in the absence of the otherwise occupied Matt Norlander. And that's because uh, you are the man in charge of the transfer rankings over at CBSSports.com. And last night, you had to update that file because Max Aismas, transfer from Oral Roberts, announced a commitment to the University of Texas. At this point, what I had planned about 30 minutes ago is to ask you, how big of a development is this for Rodney Terry? But there's more to the story now because within the past 15 minutes or so, Ron Holland, a five-star prospect who had been committed to Texas, top five player in the class of 2023, has publicly decommitted from the University of Texas. So, uh, you had some addition. Now you got some subtraction. Uh, what do you make of what's happened uh, with Texas over the past 24 hours? Well, it's crazy. And what the sad part about it is that I had a, a two hour special planned for this episode on the commitment of Posh Alexander <laughs> to, to Butler. To me, uh, the biggest transfer move of this cycle going from St. John's to Butler. And now all of a sudden, this Texas avalanche of news has just completely uh, taken Posh Alexander's blockbuster commitment out of the news cycle so um that is that it to me gary is the most uh the most tragic part of all that nobody nobody appreciates loves posh alexander more than david cobb this is something i learned in an email chain uh within the past couple of years uh you 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 you've been a big fan and i hope he breaks through for you at, at butler he just needs a new home but on the topic of undersized guards <laughs> max a smith yes uh well he's six he's listed at six one you watch him and i'm like man is max a smith really six mm. one uh, i don't know about that but uh anyway he, he still fits that mold of undersized scoring guard a la the mold of kendrick davis who was just named our transfer player of the year and in the inaugural transfer of the year uh rankings at cbs sports and i think that's the type of player he's going to be at texas next season i mean i don't need to introduce the country to max a smith <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast in late april You've seen this guy over the last three years. He's arguably, I don't even think it's a debate, the best active volume three-point shooter in the nation. And I think there's enough of a body of work against high major competition and NCAA tournament games to suggest that this is going to translate pretty seamlessly to Texas, where, oh, by the way, he's going to have better talent around him and where he also won't be asked to shoot the ball 17 or 18 times a game as he has done at times over the years for Oral Roberts. So huge pickup for Rodney T Terry and the Longhorns, but obviously uh, confounding less than, you know, 24 hours after it to get hit with this thing that, that Ron Holland is asking for a release from his letter of intent. Just some numbers on Ace Smith. So he averaged 21.9 points, 4.4 rebounds, 4.0 assists this season, made 37.3% of the 9.4 three-pointers he attempted per game. Sample size, you mentioned, uh, he's played four years of college basketball and is a career 38.8% three-point shooter, high volume. He's excellent. Led Oral Roberts to a couple of NCAA uh, tournaments. There was some thought after that Sweet 16 run that he might try to transfer. Um, he has flirted with the NBA draft, but here he is uh, back uh, ready to, to play a fifth year uh, of college basketball and a backcourt of Tyrese Hunter and Max Aceman. Assuming Tyrese Hunter is back at Texas, because I think he's declared for the draft, but is maintaining his eligibility, one of those deals. Assuming that Tyrese Hunter, Max Aceman is your starting backcourt, and that's what I'm assuming, that's, that's pretty strong. Now, the loss of Ron Holland is significant. I mean, it's a top five. It's, all five stars are not created equal. This ain't a five-star rated 19th in his class. This guy's a top four player in his class, depending on what recruiting service uh, you fancy. At 24-7 sports, he is the number four player in the class of 2023, a 6'8 forward. I've seen him high in other places, ranked as high as, as number two. So this is a, a big-time prospect who is now no longer attached to your program. He did say in his announcement that his recruitment is reopened, but that Texas is still on the list of schools he's considering. But that's not usually the way these things go. When you decommit from somebody, you're usually moving in a different direction. And you and I were talking just before we went live here, and you wondered, just sort of wondered aloud, like, 
does this mean Dylan Mitchell is 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 maybe coming back because he's a guy who's entered the draft, but he's maintaining maintaining his college eligibility. But Jonathan Gavoni, our friend at ESPN, has reported that he's really only doing that to protect himself against the injury. Short of something like that, he has no interest in going back to college, and he is a projected top thirty-five pick according to most in the upcoming. NBA draft. So I have for a while assumed uh, that he would not be at Texas next season. But as, as you, you know, sort of mentioned, like, does this Ron Holland news, maybe, maybe he knows Dylan Mitchell is, is coming back and playing time could be a little harder to get than it, than it otherwise would be. What do you make of, of all that? If Ron Holland and Dylan Mitchell, if these decisions might be connected in some way. I think we might have lost Cobb. I think we've got blooming. I think we've got Indiana Internet at David Cobb's home. We're dealing with they. We're dealing with Internet. Indiana Internet at David Cobb's home. We'll get him reconnected here in a minute. So that's the big news. Uh, a Smith to Texas and Ron Holland decommitting from Texas, all within a a twenty four hour period. I was getting ready to update the top 25 and one later on this afternoon based on a, a starting lineup of Tyrese Hunter, Max Aismas, say, I don't know, Brock Cunningham, Ron Holland, Dylan DeSue. And that was probably going to be somewhere in the top 20, maybe even top 15 for me. Take Ron Holland out of that. I still think it's strong, but obviously not as strong. Uh, Hunter, Aismas, DeSue is a, a pretty good, you know, three man core but losing a five-star top five player in the country is obviously less than ideal. David Cobb, I see your thumb. I kind of see your face. You'll back with us now. Yeah. Uh, blame the residents in, in uh, Winter Haven, Florida. That's where uh, <laughs> life has taken us for this period of time. You would think by now being like diamond ambassador, elite premier that like I would automatically connect to like the premium internet. But uh, anyway, that doesn't always happen. Plus we're all the way I, in the I corner think, of the hotel. Think, so I'm not sure what, I, I think you are eligible as a as a top shelf. Um, I too am like the best you can be at Marriott. I'm the best in the world, and I think you I think you get you get free enhanced internet, but you do have to connect to it. Feels like you didn't do that. Yeah, and you got to you got to remember your Marriott Bonvoy number, and then you got to remember your password. So That's there's a whole lot of hurdles to jump through there. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky, but yeah, uh, crazy crazy times at Texas. Yeah, my my question was, and I guess I mean why not. I wonder about, about this Holland D commitment. It's uh, hey, did uh, did Holland look at the role Dylan Mitchell played as a freshman? And say, hey, maybe I'd rather go somewhere else where they utilize freshmen more heavily. Also, Arterio Morris, formerly a five-star, uh, Texas barely played down the stretch for that team this past season under Rod. Um, Maybe Texas is just going in a direction here where it's going to be more veteran oriented and, and senior late and, and, and that type of thing. And, you know, maybe those guys saw the reading on the, on the wall there, or the writing on the wall. And maybe who knows, uh, maybe there was some communication uh, about that uh, once a Smith commits and, and you got uh, two players there who could come back in Tyrese Hunter and Dylan Mitchell. Maybe that just changes the calculus for a guy like Ron Holland. If, if the, if Texas best three players next season are Tyrese Hunter, Max a Smith, Dylan DeSue. Is that enough? Should I move them in the top 25 and one? That's a great nucleus, a great core there. You, you got to fill it out around them a little bit. But yeah, um, that's a top 15 team. And and I think this the Acemas thing can't be overstated, the significance of it for Rodney Terry, because uh, there was this idea that like, wow, well, he did a good job coaching him on the court, but we'll see if he can really put a roster together. And, and Rodney Terry pushed back on that. He was on the field of 68 with those guys at the final four or sometime around then and say, Hey, I recruited some of the guys on this team, right? Like this wasn't just Chris Beard's doing that put together the, the 22, 23 roster. And now he's gone out and landed who I believe is the number two transfer in the entire off season in Max Asmus. And I think that's a great sign of his ability to attract talent. How do you weigh that against Ron Holland, uh, Holland's decommitment? Uh, we'll, we'll see. I think, I think, the decisions of Hunter and Mitchell loom large and Mitchell is number 30 on Boone's big board and Hunter is number 41. It seems that the buzz seems that Hunter's coming back. That seems to be the buzz. Dylan Mitchell seems like a fringe guy. And if they can throw a, a bag at him, 
um, and he's a late first round guy, early second, then maybe the bag is enough to get him to come back. I think when I update the top 25 and one this afternoon, I will do it based on the idea that Tyrese Hunter is back playing in the backcourt with Max A. Smith and Dylan DeSue is in that front court. I'll have no Ron Holland, no Dylan Mitchell, and that'll be a top 25 team, but not as high as I would have had them if, if they had Ron Holland. And of course, if Dylan Mitchell decides to withdraw from the draft and, and, uh, and return to Texas, then I'll just update it again. That's how I spend my off seasons, just constantly updating the top 25 and one anytime anything gives me a legitimate reason to do so. Let's move on. You mentioned Max A. Smith, number two transfer in the country, according to your rankings. The number one guy is Michigan's Hunter Dickinson. What's the latest on him? We'll get into that next, but first, a word from our partners. Italy's best clubs and brightest stars bring show-stopping skills and unbelievable thrills in the fight to the finish for the Scudetto. Stream every Serie A match live on Paramount+. Plus. So the number one transfer available remains Michigan's Hunter Dickinson. He is reportedly considering five schools. They are Kansas, Kentucky, Georgetown, Villanova, and Maryland. David Cobb, as the king of the transfer rankings, what's the latest with Hunter Dickinson? Yeah, from what I can tell, he's got about five finalists. And, and the crazy thing about Dickinson is there's no crystal ball on him at 24-7 sports, right? So, in essence, this remains a mystery, and it's a pretty good mystery. We're talking about one of the best players in college basketball over the last couple of seasons who is uh, out there uh, flirting with some of the biggest brands in the sport. I mean, uh, at Villanova today, uh, that would be a massive get for Kyle Neptune. He's already got two of my top 40 transfers and uh, Hakeem Hart from Maryland and TJ Bamba from Washington State. If he goes to Villanova, they're all of a sudden back in Big East title conversations going into next season. But K Kansas, Kentucky, Maryland, Georgetown, also among the teams he's considering and he's either visited or been visited by all of them. So hey, a pretty interesting one here that seems to be playing out over the long run. And and can, the, the thing with Kentucky is really interesting to me because you can't have Hunter Dickinson and Oscar Sheway play okay. together. So what's going on there? That's obviously a question he needs to, to get answered and one that Kentucky needs to get answered as well because they can't end up with both of them. They won't, but they don't want to end up with neither of them either. So that, that one fascinates me. Well, it, it sounds like either Kentucky knows that Oscar Sheway is not coming back to school or they're just probably they just saying we'd rather have Hunter Dickinson than Oscar Sheway. Let's stop there. Who would you rather have? If you could only have one on the roster, which one do you want? Uh, I would take Hunter Dickinson. I think he's almost as good at scoring in the post. Not quite the voracious rebounder, but great on the boards. He's a better shot blocker, and he can step out and shoot the three. He opens up the floor. He's more dynamic than Oscar Sheway. Yeah, I don't. I don't think like it, it's on a surface level. You go, hold up. One of these guys was the consensus national player of the year two years ago the other one not quite and yet I think I probably agree with you going forward forget what's happened going forward I might rather have Hunter Dickinson in my program than Oscar Shibwe it would be wild if Oscar Shibwe was like I want to come back to Kentucky and they're like yeah we're good like yeah, yeah we're good you can and then he's in the transfer portal uh, but by by all most people seem to believe that Oscar Shibwe is 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 done at Kentucky I've just never um gone there completely because I, you know, I keep it very simple. Where is he going where he can make more money playing basketball than he can make at Kentucky? Like, where is this place? Just because somebody would like to be done with college and in the NBA doesn't mean you're going to be in the NBA. And I don't believe Oscar Sheway would be in the NBA next season. I don't think he's, I, I'm real skeptical that he's an NBA player. So that's why I've kept him projected on Kentucky's roster. Cause Regardless of what you want, at some point, it might just be the smartest thing for you to do to come back to school. But if Kentucky goes and lands Hunter Dickinson, then Oscar Sheway's uh, obvious uh, options are, are limited uh, a little bit. So that's a fascinating situation to follow. The other schools, Kansas, I think, speaks for itself. It's Kansas. It's Bill Self. If they want to be involved, they were always going to be involved. Uh, Georgetown, Ed Cooley recruited Hunter Dickinson out of high school to play at Providence. So there's an existing relationship there. That's the connection. Villanova, um, Hunter Dickinson played at DeMatha Catholic in high school with Justin Moore, who is at Villanova. So he has a high school teammate on campus there. That's an obvious connection. And then at Maryland, 
And obviously Maryland and Georgetown are local schools from him for him. He's from that area. Uh, Maryland just hired his high school coach at the math of Mike Jones to be on Kevin Willard's staff. So with three of these five schools, there's like pre-existing relationships in place. And then Kentucky is Kentucky and Kansas and Kansas. Often the transfer portal and all of this gets uh, described as free agency. It's not always exactly that, although I know what people mean. This feels like free agency. This feels like Aaron Judge um, winning an MVP and then going into an unrestricted free agency. It's like, okay, Georgetown, Maryland are home. I've got a teammate at Villanova, and Kansas and Kentucky can probably give me more money than I ever imagined I would get playing college basketball. Let's see what works best. That feels like where we're at right now. The idea that Hunter Dickinson would one day play for Maryland seemed wild a couple of years ago. I mean, do you remember him jawing at that Maryland bench when they were playing during the COVID season and stuff? Like, he and Mark Turgeon had beef, Mm. legitimate beef. And there was some serious animosity between not only Dickinson and Maryland, but it felt like Michigan and Maryland, right? Like, Jawan Howard didn't make a ton of friends his first couple of years back in the college game. So Hunter Dickinson going home to play for Maryland under Kevin Willard. Uh, that's just uh, one of the, would be one of the all time plot twists of the transfer portal era, because it felt like those two were arch nemeses. And I know it's home for him. I know DeMatha is just right down the road and, and he's got an obvious connection there on staff now, but just seeing him in that uniform would have been an unthinkable visual a couple of years ago, but it, it's a very plausible situation and it would golly just make maryland it would have to shoot them right up to the top next to purdue michigan state in terms of favorites to win the big 10 next season all right let's do predictions before we get out of here hunter dickinson will play college basketball where next season oh uh let me let me massage the crystal ball here your crystal ball what do we got here um We'll say Kansas. It seems like in terms of, of bags, they should be pretty well-equipped. Uh, they didn't have a traditional big, really, this past season. I mean, they played K.J. Adams, undersized five, Zuby Edge of four. Um, yeah, Ernest Uday was on that team, too. I, I think he could go in there and, and just be the guy right away. I mean, Jalen Wilson's gone, right? So there's a lot of points available for him at Kansas. Uh no, no real competition either. It's not like they got to push somebody out. So I think he could go there pretty seamlessly and it could work. Best fit, maybe. I'm, I'm not not sure where he's going to go, but like that's what I see as being the best fit and the most sensible option. I, I imagine anywhere he goes, he's the man from day one. I mean, he is an established college basketball star, an, an, a, a, a guy who is a proven producer uh, at the highest level of, of the sport. So uh, I think he'll be awesome literally anywhere he goes. And I guess I would just, if I got to make a bet on it, I'll just bet on the school that usually wins these things. And that is Kentucky, you know, like John Calipari doesn't, he misses sometimes and gets beat sometimes, but um, I don't know, man, look, man, but if I'm Hunter Dickinson, do I want to go play with a bunch of freshmen? And- like, I don't know. He, he's, he's, he's already, coming out of that situation with like Jet Howard and mm-hmm. Kobe Buffkin and some of these younger players, right? Like, I, I mean, you're not wrong. Like obviously right. Kentucky is Kentucky and they, that the brand and the, and, and all of it, like it's, it's not a bad pick. I just, if I'm Hunter Dickinson, that, that seems like an exhausting proposition to me to go play with a bunch of young guards. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you can, you, you can weigh these all in a variety of ways. And if I were doing pros and cons on Kentucky, the pros would be, um, you know, it's Kentucky. You're probably going to make literally millions of dollars doing it. And y- you would be surrounded by future NBA talent. That's all good. The, the con would be, man, they're young. And recent history suggests that's not, with that many freshmen, that is not how you actually win a national championship. I'd have a better chance to do that somewhere else ultimately like he could pick and i don't really think there's a bad decision to be made here sometimes you see a school and it's like oh i'm certain he won't go there any of these make sense to me i could i could close my eyes and and if you told me make a case for kansas make a case for kentucky make a case for georgetown make a case for villanova make a case for maryland why hunter dickinson should 
commit to each of those schools, I don't think it's hard to do. I, I could make an argument for any of them. Ultimately, I'll just bet on Kentucky simply because that's the that's the school that ends up with the best talent most most years, if not um, if not most years, then certainly a lot of them. Fair enough. And if Kentucky strikes out, well, hey, Oscar, come on back, man. Like, <laughs> need you, buddy. It could it could go down that way. Uh, it's it, it, it's a fascinating off season. Like I'm about to update the top 25 and one for the ninth time. And you know, Mike DeCourcy was making this point um, either earlier in the week or maybe last week. We we should embrace this as opposed to roll our eyes at it because the NBA is probably the best at making the off season and quote unquote free agency like a big part of the calendar. Like, like, you know, when, when free agency opens, it is that that's when in the NBA and according you know, for some people is the most interesting. Like some people enjoy the summers more than they enjoy the actual seasons because of all the storylines and, and different things going on behind the scenes. And we clearly now have that in college basketball and it, it, it can create headlines. It can create interest in the sport and I, I, whether it's media or coaches or anybody else, I think it would be wise to stop being bothered by this new way of doing things and instead sort of celebrate it and highlight it and, and acknowledge that it does give us a lot of off season content that we otherwise would not have. Yeah. And hire people to help you manage it. If That's you're a right. coach and you don't want to work 24, seven, 365, go hire a general manager, go hire a, a Rachel Baker, like a Duke did go hire a Baker Dunleavy, like Villanova did. Let, let some people come around you and take some of that burden off. If you're not an analytics guru, you're a head coach. Well, uh, fill out your support staff with people who are, uh, you think Eric Musselman is, is summing through spreadsheets all the time. I'm sure he's adept at that stuff and can read it, but like, he's got guys around him who can tell him, Hey, this person is somebody we need to contact because of X, Y, and Z. And they literally contact like everybody in the portal. You know, do you think Eric Musselman is the one sitting there texting uh, every single guy who hits the portal for Arkansas? I doubt it. I'm sure he gets in on, on the big time guys, but like, you know, yeah, you can complain about it if you want to, if you're a coach, but by now it should be readily apparent that this is the world that we live in. And, and I would actually argue, where do you stand on this? I'm curious. Is prospect high school prospect identification and recruiting uh, still the most important form of talent acquisition in college basketball or is monitoring the transfer market, recruiting transfers and, and being able to know which transfers will fit. Has that become more important than traditional high school recruiting? I think, tra tra I think the transfer portal is now more important than, um, than recruiting high school players. I, I, if I were at a power conference program that aspires for greatness I wouldn't recruit anything, any high school player outside of the top 50. I just, I mean, with rare exception. I mean, it, it, maybe there's a guy who's 73rd, but you just really believe in him. Then go get that guy, fine. But if you are a power conference program aspiring for greatness, odds are if you take somebody ranked out of, and I'm just throwing an arbitrary number at 50, it might actually be 75. Either way, you get the point. Um, if you take those guys, those guys are not likely to make big impacts as freshmen. And then they are likely to become frustrated because they're not playing and ultimately enter the transfer portal. I would take I would take highly ranked freshmen who I know can help me and transfers. That that's that's what I would do. I, I do not understand when I see a big time program go out and sign somebody in this era ranked 134th in the country. Like that guy, what are you doing with that guy? You're gonna bring him on campus. He's going to sit on your bench and then he's going to transfer is just a waste of time for everybody. So I can tell you just as someone who covers this sport, I don't pay attention to the high school rankings as much as I used to. I don't think they're as important as they used to be. You can build your team through the transfer portal much more easily than you can build a competent team trying to go out and sign high school players and then develop them and keep them. It's just much harder to do those things than it used to do. I would be taking elite high school guys who I know can help and surrounding them with the guys I bring back and transfers I bring in. I, it's a pretty simple recipe from my perspective. Yeah, and we're still several weeks out here from this thing getting wrapped up. May 11th is the deadline to enter the portal. There's no deadline for when you have to commit. So, I mean, you look at guys like 
Tyler Perry, Jalen Tyson, Matthew Cleveland, Joe Girard, Jaden Bradley, just to name a few. And then we get a, a, another addition today, the Ivy League Player of the Year from Penn. Uh, says he's going to enter the portal. So there could be a way, another wave here at the 11th hour of guys entering the portal. I don't, I'm not talking like hundreds of impact guys, but w- would I be shocked if, if a dozen of the eventual top 100 transfers of this cycle uh, enter over the next week and a half or so? Uh, no, pro- probably not, because there's a lot of moving parts here. And decisions that guys make will have a domino effect, both in terms of are they staying in the NBA draft, or are they coming back, or you know, if Hunter Dickinson – commits to Kentucky, right? Does that send Shibway into the portal hypothetically, right? So there, there are moving parts here. And I don't envy those coaches who want to be at Disney World right now. I'm sorry, guys, but uh, it's the era we live in. At the uh, So here's a, a, a neat little exercise. I, I think that at the top of any high school class, like you just get transcendent talents. You know, that's where you're going to see a, a Kevin Durant one year, a Derrick Rose one year, like those level guys, and you want those level guys. So maybe in this class that we're about to graduate, it's Isaiah Collier, Aaron Bradshaw, Justin Edwards, DJ Wagner. Like you want those guys because they're they're one and done lottery picks who, for you know, for the most part, projected one and done lottery picks who should be able to have big impacts as freshmen. But once you get away from those guys, I think I'd rather tick for tat have the transfer rather than the freshman let me put it this way right now in your transfer rankings number 10 is harrison ingram in the class of 2023 according to 24 7 sports composite um omaha Ballou, i believe that's the way you pronounce his last name is going to iowa state who would you rather have for next season the 10th ranked transfer well, are the 10th ranked high school freshman. I mean, Harrison Ingram was a safer bet. <laughs> is there a chance that Baloo could pop and, and maybe be better than Ingram? Uh, there, yeah, there's yeah. a chance. Yeah, there's a chance, uh, sure. But, but you got two years worth of, of data on Harrison Ingram from a power conference level to show you what he can be. So I'm with you, man. I think it's, it's uh, the, way, the way of the world. But you know, something that's interesting to me that doesn't really make a ton of sense is why we're still seeing – mid-majors have so much success and these unexpected teams thrive on the NCAA tournament stage, uh, Florida Atlantic, San Diego state. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just as simple as, as, as getting old, retaining, uh, players year over year, having that continuity. But you look at the NFL draft last night and all 31, all 31 players taken in the first round came from power five schools, all 31 of them. Crazy, right? Um, Yeah. I don't think we'll ever see that in, well, I shouldn't say ever because um, the power conferences are going to ultimately eat up the good mid-majors and then we're going to have more power conference teams, quote unquote, quote unquote, power conference teams than ever. So I'd be, I'd be, I don't, I would be surprised if somebody could tell me that the first round of an entire NBA draft has been nothing but power conference players before. It just feels like that's never happened. No way. Yeah. And it, it seems unlikely Although if, you know, the power conferences eat up the Goodman majors, then maybe we could, we could get there someday, but like, okay. Number one transfer Hunter Dickinson, who would you rather have next year? Hunter Dickinson or Isaiah Collier, the number one player in the class of 2023. Yeah. Dickinson. Right. Who would you rather have Max Smith, the number two transfer or the number two high school player, Justin Edwards? Yeah. I'll take Smith. I think so. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. I think I'd rather have you put you name the number. I look at the transfer and the high school player connected to that number. I think in most cases, you're going to want to take the transfer. Yeah, and I will say th- there's like a caveat here too. like 24 seven sports. I know these guys, they rank based off largely based off of NBA potential. When I'm ranking these transfers, I'm trying to do it based off who's going to be most impactful right. uh, at college basketball next season. So like, for instance, gg jackson last season how impactful was he on college basketball Eh, not very uh but that doesn't mean he he was less of an nba prospect because he played for a bad team with a first year coach you know so i do rank these guys a little bit differently i'm not ranking them off of their nba potential or else max a smith would be a little bit further down the list traymon mark would be higher than max a smith for example you know so so there is a difference in the methodology of course 
But when you're out there recruiting as a college basketball coach, you ain't looking necessarily at their NBA potential. Like it's great to have those guys who are one and done and go rep your school in the league, but you're trying to win ball games, right? So um, there, there's a slight difference there in terms of the way you know rankings are done. Um, but I will say that, like you know, for mine, I'm looking at who's going to be most impactful in college basketball, and that's why when this thing is all said and done, I might change some guys around, you know, because you know, th- there's some players who are going to end up at uh, schools that, you know, let's say Ace Baldwin, he's going to Penn State. Do I really believe Penn State's going to be an NCAA tournament team next season? No, I don't. So Ace Baldwin's probably not going to be all that impactful, right? So like maybe he gets docked a little bit. Um, so that's kind of the way I, I look at things versus maybe how they rank high school yeah, prospects. Yeah, and just for what it's worth, I think that is the proper approach that you should be taking. Like, don't worry about the NBA. We're, we're not worried about where these guys are going to play professionally. Who's going to be impactful in college next season? That's in the transfer portal right now. Now, Posh let's Alexander. Rank, now let's, Posh rank Alexander. Them, let's rank them accordingly. Uh, I, I, I'll say this, then we'll get out of here. I, I talked to Kelvin Sampson about exactly what we're talking about back during the season, and he acknowledged, like, you know, give me, you know, he coached Eric Gordon once upon a time as a freshman. Like, yeah, give me that guy. All right, I'll take the Aaron Gordon five star freshman. I love those guys, but he was like, most of these five star freshmen, not all of them, but most of them. You take him, I'll take Jamal Shedd, and I'll and I'll I'll win that. Because I'd okay, rather here. I'd rather have twenty one year old Jamal Shedd than eighteen year old six one guard ranked twelfth in the country. Okay, okay. So before we get out of here, if say you had the option between who Brandon Miller was for Alabama, off court stuff aside, who Brandon Miller was for Alabama during the twenty two twenty three season, you could have that player. Or you could have Hunter Dickinson. Who do you pick? I want Brandon Miller, I think. But like that's different. They, 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 when I you say, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I say that about these freshmen, I mean like the ones who are so awesome that, that are awesome prospects and awesome players immediately. Like I want then I'll take those guys. Like Brandon Miller is the type of freshman I want. Uh Paulo Bancaro is the type of freshman I want. Like those guys, you take them over the transfers because they are so gifted that they can overwhelm college basketball, even as freshmen. But when you take, there's only three or four of those guys in most classes that are like, they're, they're, they were projected one and dones, but in between, you know, when that one year in college, they are absolutely balling out. There's a handful of them. There's like 25 five-star prospects and about five of them rise to the level of that guy. You can win the whole thing with him. Brandon Miller was one of them. I want those guys. I'm talking about the other 20, like the, the, the five-star guard who's ranked 12th in his class. And he's going to do what a typical guy ranked 12th in his class does as a freshman. Kelvin's point was I'd rather have a, a, a Jamal shed. Who's been with me for three years and is physically mature. I'd rather have that guy than just an 18 year old who is talented, but not, Derek Rose, Eric Gordon, talented, just talented enough to be listed as a five-star prospect in his class. Yeah, and if you're Texas, you'd rather have Max A. Smith than A.J. Johnson, who decommitted and is going to play in Australia. Because, yeah, uh, Johnson was a five-star prospect, but he could have turned out like Artario Morris and been the, your eighth man or whatever and played nine minutes a game or something. And with A. Smith, you've got a proven track record of production that suggests he's going to be an incredible player for you uh, in the in the season ahead. All right. I'm sure you got to update your transfer rankings any moment now. Oh gosh, what happened while we were talking? I don't know. I'm just assuming something <laughs> must have. I'm just assuming. Probably. I'm just assuming something must have. So let's get out of here on that. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. Thank you guys once again for watching, listening to the I Own College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Five stars. Nice words. There's more of us than there are of them that needs to be reflected in the comments. So you guys knock that out. We'll talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.